Lord, we come again before you. Thank you that when we are weak, that's when you show up. Thank you that you don't abandon us in our weakness, that you don't let us go in our own strength. Lord, we commit this night to you, asking that your Holy Spirit would energize and animate this Bible study, and that, Lord, we would sense the presence of God. And as we touch on a specific subject, that we would be able to respond specifically to it. Lord, we pray that every man would disappear except the man Christ Jesus. We pray that he would be loved and adored. If people came in here with low energy, if people came in here with low faith, with low anything that is outside of your will, fill our cups, Lord. We pray. Oh, how we need the empowerment of your Holy Spirit in this moment. Lest this become a dull, dead meeting and we leave here the same way we came in. Far be it from us, Lord. We put away the arm of the flesh. We put away any manipulation and we just ask for the raw power of God to be so evident and real in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've been the past few weeks discussing deep doctrine about the Trinity, the person of Jesus Christ, his humanity, his divinity, but it could quite possibly so that that, that plane is landing and we might be entering into Deuteronomy sooner than we thought, maybe. We'll see where the Lord leads us. But if you haven't been with us, we've been talking about the person of Jesus Christ. How the scripture define him, declare him, and how we need to respond to him appropriately to what the Bible has revealed about him. And so we've talked about his humanity, we've been talking about his divinity, and we're going to talk about another angle that would defend the fact that Jesus Christ is in fact God. But we're going to start with a different foundation. This might seem like a random piece to this puzzle of the Bible study in the beginning, but you're going to see how it connects near the end. But I want us to look at a specific subject concerning our faith that will relate to this whole series about the person of Jesus Christ by looking at and maybe understanding more for our own benefit what this subject really means to us and how it does relate to the God that we serve. You know, there are a lot of languages that we use, a lot of phrases, a lot of Christianese that... Uh, we might have that we don't really know the, the understanding of it. We don't really know, comprehend even what we're trying to say. Even with biblical language, we kind of say it, we sing it, we preach it, we pray it, but we don't really know, we don't feel it, and we may not even have a complete understanding of what we're actually trying to declare. So when we say words like faith, what do you mean? When we say words like glory, what do we mean? When you hear a phrase like the fear of the Lord, what comes to mind? Holiness. What's that all about? And I think one word that is on the top of that list of perhaps being misunderstood and misapplied even is the word worship. Worship. We use it all the time. We hear it all the time. But do we really know what it means? I think we need to understand what it means because it relates to how we interact with our God. Worship. We're going to take advantage of this specific subject by covering the basis of what this actually means for us as Christians. Is there anywhere in the Bible that gives us a clear definition of what worship is? Wouldn't that be nice to be able to go to the scriptures and see these words with a definition that follows it? Oftentimes the scriptures don't give us that. But in your mind right now, can you think of a place in the Bible that might give us some clarity of what it means for a Christian to worship God? Yes. It started like whether, whatever you eat or drink to offer the glory of God. Okay. Came to mind. Sure. That's okay. That's, we want to know what comes to mind. Yes. Uh, Gospel of John, Jesus says, one day you won't worship me in a certain place, but in spirit and in truth. Okay. So worshiping God means that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And we even use that, but do we even really know what that means? What does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? Truth makes more sense, but spirit. Okay, that's a great scripture. We're going to touch on that. What does it mean to worship? What does the Bible give us concerning worship? It's Romans 12. Romans 12, 1. What does that say about worship? That your bodies is given up as a living sacrifice, which is an acceptable form of worship. Yes? Like giving? Giving is a form of worship, yeah. 
That's an expression of worship. Absolutely. But th- these things are touching on what worship looks like, what the nature of worship is, but what really, in essence, is worship? What does it mean to say, I worship God? One of the definitions could be serving. Serve? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think this is, this is where the Bible challenges us because many times we don't get clear-cut definitions. What we do get is commands, instructions, examples, sprinkled throughout the Bible, and what we need to do is bring these things together to make an unmistakable conclusion of what something is. For example, when you hear the word faith, is there anywhere in the Bible where it gives us a clear definition of faith? Hebrews 11, right? In what? The first two verses, we understand what faith is. Now, you know what I find amazing about the understanding of faith? Is that you look at the first two verses, and it describes what faith is, And the rest of Hebrews 11 does not spend time trying to explain or, you know, uh, give philosophy of what faith is. It gives demonstration of what faith looks like. The rest of Hebrews 11 says, this is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. This is what faith looks like. Spends less time defining it. Spends more time displaying it. And I think that's true with worship. I think if we really want to get down to the core of what worship is, and not going to the expressions of worship, not going to necessarily the commands of what worship looks like, we should go to a clear example of what worship is and derive our definition from that. Does anybody know where the first time in the Bible the word worship is given? The first time we see worship mentioned in the Bible. If you were here in the beginning of this Bible study, I mean, talking years ago, you'll know. Give you some time to think. Maybe what he did, but I'm talking about the word worship. Before Exodus. Yeah, flip those pages. That's good. No Google, though. (laughs) Just pages. Abraham, for sure, but before Abraham, there's someone. No, you're there. You're there, yeah. Where is worship mentioned the first time? Yes. What chapter? (laughs) Come on, Pete. You're there. You just need the chapter, not 16, not 17. Now you're just throwing numbers. Mm Mm-mm. Chapter, chapter. We're in the right book. We're in Genesis. 22. 22. You got it, Eddie. Genesis chapter 22. Let's go to verse 1 of Genesis chapter 22. I think one of the best ways to understand what worship is is to see where it is first mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 22, 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar. Here it is in verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship. And come again to you. The first time that the Bible mentions the word worship is in light of the fact that Abraham is ready to respond to God's command to give up his most prized possession on this earth. So what do you derive from worship when you understand that that's the first place that it's mentioned? As though the Bible wants to ingrain in your mind and mind that for the rest of your reading in the Bible, you would understand worship through the filter, through the foundation of this man giving up his son, yes. To surrender your own will, your own desires, in order to be in complete obedience to God. Oh, okay, so worship, you know, Abraham wasn't saying, hang on guys, we're going to go up there and three, sing three songs before the message and come back to you. Okay, yes. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Absolutely. So this is where worship is mentioned. This is the first thing that we see concerning this word. And this is what we can safely conclude with understanding what worship is. It is to have a heart posture that continually 
acknowledges God as the most supreme object of your love, adoration, and obedience. It's not something you turn on and off. It's something that's continually there that is expressed in many ways. So he says, I'm going to go up there and worship with my son, and we're going to come back to you. I think to myself, not only is that the act of worship, but the heart posture that Abraham had behind that act. Do you think he did this reluctantly? Do you think Abraham did this gritting his teeth? Go back to verse 3 and see. When God gave him that command, notice how he responded. So Abraham rose early. He didn't sleep in. You want me to give up my son, Lord? I'll set up my alarm early. I want to obey you as quick as I can. And not only that, look at the Lord here. He strategically tells him to go to a specific location that would take three days to get there. Three days. That's a lot of time to think. That's a lot of time to reflect. That's a lot of time to turn back if you really wanted to turn back. And he gives him that extended period to walk with his son, to journey to this place and to contemplate that decision. You know, I'm all for responding to messages right after it's preached, but there's something significant about meditating before you make a decision in your life. I think one of the most impactful things that we can do after even one of the most fiery meetings is to not necessarily have people respond, though that is powerful and God uses the moment. We've seen God use those moments. But it's a very dangerous thing sometimes to respond in the heat of a meeting and to make quick vows. I think sometimes, and it's happened even in some meetings, where the best thing you could do is just get in your car, go home, and lay in bed and think about what you're going to do before you do it. Because God is not into just quick things happening. He wants us to really think and marinate on what we're about to say and do. And so he goes on a three-day journey. He's thinking, thinking, thinking. Can you imagine what was going on through his mind? Sure, he had faith. Sure, he believed God that he would bring Isaac back from the dead. He saw Isaac come into life through a 90-something-year-old woman. But still, he was human. Surely he felt the weight of what he was about to do. But he did it. He did it with joy. He did it, and God was testing him to see if he still loved them the way he did when he first walked with him. He was willing to leave his country in the beginning. Okay, now you're willing to give up your son. And that's important for us to understand. You and I have to make a decision, brothers and sisters. Here's the decision that you and I have to make. That we are still willing to zealously follow the Lord as we did in the beginning of our confession, even though if the emotions that we had in the beginning don't follow us through. Understand? We have to make that choice that even though the emotions and the butterflies and the sense of everything being miraculous when you first got saved, even if that does not follow you throughout the years, you're still willing to be committed throughout it all. And so years have passed. You know what God wants to know? Do you still love me, Abraham? Do you still adore me? Do you still treasure me above all things? And I believe that it's not just in this incident, but in many parts of the scripture, we see God. Not in some strange way, but in a genuine, sincere way, testing the level of our adoration for him at times. Here's another instance where that happens. John chapter 21 with Peter. You can turn there. This is where God restores Peter in Christ. In John 21, 15, after Jesus and the disciples had breakfast, I love that. Jesus has breakfast with his boys. He knew how to fill and meet the physical needs before he brought any spiritual application. Did that many times. John 21, 15, it says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. People debate what Jesus meant when he said, do you love me more than these? Was Jesus talking about the rest of the disciples? Because Peter had made that confession before, right? That quick confession that even though all these men abandon you, I will not abandon you, Lord. And some say it was the fish because they had just caught 153 fish and they had hauled it on to the dry land. And they just finished eating and had their fill. And Jesus says, do you love me more than this? I, I perhaps lean more on that than anything. They hear the disciples Peter going back to what he was doing before he was called by Christ. 
They make a major catch. And notice, it was not by their own power. It was not by their own wit. Jesus was standing on the shore telling them how to make that catch. So it was a result of the blessing of God. It was a result of the wisdom of God. It was a result of the power of God that they're even eating in the first place. But it was in a moment of blessing in which Jesus challenges Peter love and says, Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your business? Do you love me more than this idea of a secure finance for your future? Do you love me more than your own comfort, Peter? Do you love me more than these? Abraham, do you love me more than your son? I blessed him with you. But do you still love me more than him? I think there's a healthy, sanctifying question that you and I can ask ourselves in different seasons of life, especially in those seasons in which we are experiencing great blessing from God, whether on a ministry level or any level. And it's this. We should ask ourselves this. Lord, do I love you more than this? That's a sobering thing. And let's not ask ourselves once, because we'll quickly answer yes. But if we, if we really want to ask ourselves and sanctify our hearts, let's continually walk in that. That with whatever he gives you by his hand, to continually reflect and say, Lord, do I love you more than this? Sometimes you'll be surprised that that love could be challenged because our hearts will continually be challenged Things in this life will try to push off Jesus Christ off the throne of your affections and mine on a daily basis. Daily basis. So we see it with Abraham. We see it with Peter. And if you're not able to put Isaac on the altar, and if I'm not able to walk away from 153 fish, we have to ask ourselves some serious questions if we realize who Jesus is. So we understand what worship is. To acknowledge God continually as a supreme object of our love, adoration, and surrender. To worship him is to treasure him above all things. To worship him is to be willing to surrender anything and everything at any time. To worship him is to say yes when he tells us to say yes. To say no when he tells us to say no. It's to look at your eyes and be able to say, I can put this up on the altar. In Abraham's case, he got Isaac back. But in your case and mine, sometimes you're not going to get him back. The most prized possession that you have. The most prized person that you have. There are people who have paid a high price to put a hymn on the altar. To follow Jesus. There are people who paid a high price to put her on the altar. And some got him back. Some got her back. Some didn't. But in the end, Jesus is worthy of it all. So Jesus here says, do you love me more than these? And the nature of worship is what... Barrett brought up earlier in John chapter 4. Let's go there quickly in John chapter 4, 23 to 24. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Does anybody have an idea? I mean, truth. What does it mean to worship in truth? This is what the Father is looking for, yes. According to his word. According to the revelation of who God is. According to his character. According to his dealings. According to what we've been studying the past few weeks. Understanding the depths of who he is and his character and his nature. All these wonderful things. And responding to him according to that and not making a God in our own image. Truth. Revelation. Scripture. Not our own imagination. Not on what we think God is like or who God is to us. No, what the Bible reveals. This frames our worship. This funnels our worship. We need the scriptures. Truth. But what does it mean in spirit? Because it's not just truth. A lot of people worship in truth, but they have no spirit. A lot of people worship in spirit, and they have no truth. Jesus says, I want you to worship in spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship in spirit? I think one simple way of understanding it is realizing where the spirit resides, where the spirit abides. Where is your spirit? It's an internal thing. It's from the inside out. God is not interested in external things. He wants it to flow from within. And I believe spirit, a great part of it is your affections, your heart. It's not just about parroting words off a screen. It's not about lifting your hands so people see that you lift your hands. Nobody's fooled. People could be fooled, but God's not fooled. It's about the spirit. It's about the inside. It's about if you were to open this chest up, you would see that there's a heart that beats for God. 
And God wants to marry spirit and truth for it to be authentic worship unto him. And this is what Jesus says, that the nature of worship, head and heart, the nature of worship is this marriage in which I have your affection and I have your reason. I have your thinking. I have your mind and your heart. Can I read a quote from Jonathan Edwards? I love this quote, just looking into this. This is what Jonathan Edwards said. I should think myself in the way of my duty to raise the affections of my hearers as high as possibly, provided that they are affected with nothing but truth. So he was a preacher. And he says, you know what my ambition is? Is that when people hear me preach, that their affections would be elevated so high, solely, only, if their affections are being affected by truth. And that's what we need to get to in our place too, in our walk with God, in our worship with the Lord. That our spirit responds to truth and it creates this aroma unto God for true worship. Now, we understand what worship is, we understand the nature of worship, but we have to understand how worship is expressed. And we've already mentioned some of this. But you can summarize it in two verses in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Two verses summarize what really worship is expressed like. Hebrews 13 is a powerful verse, and we've read it before, before worship services. In verse 15 and 16. Hebrews 13, 15 and 16. And you really see two types of sacrifices being made here in terms of worship. Hebrews 13, 15 and 16. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Now we see the word sacrifice in that verse. And that word sacrifice is associated with my lips. Your lips. Acknowledging his name in praise. So it's a mouth thing. It's, it's melody. It's songs. It's praise. It's thanksgiving. It's prayer. It's confession. This is a form of worship. To say that this is what we just did 10 minutes ago wasn't worship is false, but it's not limited to that. It's an expression of worship. It has to do with the mouth. But verse 16 continues and tells us what else it's like. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So then we see sacrifices again. Now those words are echoing the Old Testament. The language found there in terms of the Israelites worshiping the Lord with their sacrifices in the temple. And that was the foundation of these authors' Bibles and their, their writings. Hey, you know how they sacrifice? And a majority of those sacrifices says to brought a pleasing aroma to God? That's what happens when you sing. And that's what happens when you give. And that's what happens when you restrain yourself from sin. And that's what happens when you share your gift. And that's what happens when you give money. Those things is worship. It's worship. So we see these expressions of worship that it has to do with the mouth, has to do with my hands. Saying, well, why is this important to understand? And why are we talking about worship? Because if there's one component of worship that we must understand, it is this that it exclusively belongs to God alone. Worship exclusively belongs to God. And this is where we're making our transition to the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. <laughs> Beginning in verse 8. This is when Jesus was being tempted. And unfortunately, this scripture is twisted by those who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So you know what Jesus is doing here? He's affirming what we've been saying, that worship belongs to the Lord alone. But unfortunately, many have used this scripture, who deny that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, to say this is proof that Jesus Christ is deflecting any idea of receiving worship and is ascribing it to God alone, proving that he is not divine, or else he would have said, worship me, because I'm God. Right? Jesus should have said, if he was God in the flesh, 
No, devil, worship me. I'm God. I'm the one that's supposed to receive you and others bowing down at my feet. But he doesn't say that. This is the argument. Which is a terrible argument. Because all this does is reinforce the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Because if you're familiar with the rest of the Gospels, you will see that Jesus Christ did receive worship and never rebuked or rejected anybody for it. And so the connection is a terrible one to make, unfortunately. But when those who maliciously or ignorantly want to twist scriptures to defend falsehood, they'll go to desperate measures to do it. And so we see here that Jesus is about to show us through his life, through his response, that he's God. Jesus was worshipped, is still being worshipped, and will be worshipped forever and ever. And if Jesus Christ did not want to receive worship, then he would have responded to a lot of people who did receive worship and rejected it as men. Some examples? Some examples in the Bible where we see men who received worship, men who represented God, men who represented Christ, and did not entertain the thought? Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 14. Yes, we're going to turn there in a moment. A lot of these things are actually found in the book of Acts. The angel of Revelations too. Okay, in Revelations we see that John bows down and says, Oh no, I'm a servant just like you, absolutely. So we're talking about celestial beings as well. Sure. Peter and Cornelius. Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Why don't we do that? We're going to go through the book of Acts and do this just bullet point real quick. Acts chapter 10. Just to see that if Jesus Christ was just a man, then surely he would have responded in a radical fashion as a response to people trying to give him worship. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met, and met him and fell down on his feet and worshipped him. And what does Peter do? But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. You will never see Jesus Christ saying that when people have fell down and worshipped him. Fully man, yeah, but fully God. Peter says, no, 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 what are you doing? Get up. Don't worship me. Though he's an agent of Christ, though he's a representative, though he's an ambassador, though he's an apostle, no, that does not belong to me. I'm the messenger. Get up, Cornelius. Okay? Let's look at an example of somebody who did receive worship and did not reject it. Can you guys think of an example? It's in the book of Acts. Who received worship and did not reject it and paid a high price for it? Yes, you're going to say the same thing? Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to him. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, let's just stop there. What do you do in that moment when somebody calls you a God? You don't do what he's about to do, and that's receive it and entertain it and enjoy it because something happens immediately. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. You know what I find so significant about this passage? It's Herod. And consider the context now. Look how quick God was to judge this man for receiving glory and not giving it to God. You know why it's significant? Can we go back to verse 1 and 2 of the same chapter and see what Herod did earlier and see how God did not intervene immediately. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. You can keep going. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. If you read that, you know what you see? You see a man who killed a leader of the Christian movement. And you know what God doesn't do? Intervene and kill him right away. But when it came to receiving glory and praise, God came in right away and says, you don't touch my glory. Murder? 
I'll delay your judgment till later. Receiving glory, I'm going to take care of that right now. That's how much God is jealous for his praise. So this is not something to mess around with. This is not something to entertain. This is not something to joy. When it comes to glory, God does not share it. He shares his love. He shares his patience. He shares his blessing. There's one thing that God will never share. That's his glory. That's his glory. So when it came with Herod, immediately. Murder, we'll wait. We'll put that on the receipt, but not my praise. That belongs to me alone. Now we go to Acts chapter 14. And what do we see? Paul and Barnabas. Reacting completely the opposite of how Herod did in verse 11. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, what did he, what did he do? With authority, saw a man who never walked get up and start walking. They lifted up their voices saying, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with crowds. Can you imagine the chaos? Here's this miracle. This man stands up for the first time. They identify Paul. They identify Barnabas as these gods. gods and they're about to sacrifice to them. They're about to have a party. They're about to lay these things out before them as gods. And how do they respond? But when the apostles, in verse 14, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd. Oh, if Herod would have done the same thing. Crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And they begin to preach to these pagans, trying to introduce them to the true and living God. Now, this isn't the main point either, but I just find it of so much value that when you read on, you see something so significant concerning a very real thing that can happen to you and I, and that's fish for the praise of men. If you're ever in a place where you desire to receive hero worship, or the acknowledgement by others. Please realize, as we're going to find out in just a verse, of how fickle, how quick people change with their opinion about you and me. If you live for the opinions of men, you're in for a ride. Because you will realize very quickly that the same people that are willing to sacrifice, well, let's just read verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. The same crowd that was praising them and willing to pat them on the back and elevate them and worship them and sacrifice them, the same crowd that stoned them. You and I have to be very careful of trying to live for the approval of people because the same people that will love you and hug you and praise you and elevate you and tell you the greatest things are the same ones that will pull rocks out of their pocket and nail you on the head. They did it. Praise God, these men did not live for the opinions of men. They lived for the glory of God alone. They were willing to die for it. And that's what they were willing to do in this moment. So we see here, just very quick, we lay a foundation that these representatives of Christ, these agents of the Lord, did not receive worship without rejecting it, without rebuking it. And now we see Jesus Christ in a different place. Christ received worship. Christ did not only receive worship, he demanded worship. When's the first time Jesus Christ received worship? When was the first time the Lord received worship from man? John the Baptist? John the Baptist? Nathaniel? Nathaniel? Matthew 2.2 2 is the answer. Matthew 2.2 2 is the answer. Where Jesus first received worship. Hear the wise men saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him as a baby. Now some might argue, well, I, he was a child so he couldn't rebuke and he couldn't reject. He was just there and he had to just absorb it. Then if that's the argument... Now let's go to his adult years and see how he received worship. There's so many places you can go to the Bible. But let's just look at these key scriptures to see how Jesus Christ, in fact, did receive praises from others. 
Can you think of anything? Can you think of a moment? Can you think of a scene in the Bible where it happens? Thomas and John. Okay, that's a huge one. That's a salt. That's the go-to one. Absolutely, in John chapter 20. Any other place? You read a scripture once. After the resurrection, the woman did what? Mary. The Marys, when Jesus came out. Of the- and the Matthew? Yes. Yeah. What did they do? They worshipped him. How? They took him by the feet. Took by the feet that's it. They took him by the feet. And they worshipped him, those nail-pierced feet. They loved the Lord. And he didn't say, get up, what are you doing? No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm an exalted creature. No, 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 no. I'm God's favored one. No, no, no. He received it. Think about the blind man that was born blind in John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Just, this is just scripture night, okay? Can we just hear scripture? John chapter 9, let me just read this to you in verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Look at the desperation. I want to know who he is. Just tell me who he is, and I'm willing to believe. Just show me who the Son of Man is. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. Fell in love with him. Love at first sight. This is the first time that this man saw. And he saw the Son of Man, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, hey, what are you doing? Get out of here. No, he received it. John chapter 20. A week, about a week after the resurrection. He had brother Tom miss the meeting. Jesus appeared, he wasn't there. And so he says, I'm not believing until I see those wounds, and I put my fingers in them. It says that eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it on my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And verse 28 says, Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Now, why is that significant? Why is that statement significant? Because you know why this is the... I believe the go-to verse, because many people will argue worship and bowing down does not necessarily mean in the original that it is to ascribe praises unto God. You see that men have bowed down before kings in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that they're God. Fine, if you want to use that argument. But when you come to this text, it's undeniable. There's no wiggle room to say that this is anything but pure, authentic worship. What's, What's being said here? My Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't reject the statement. Jesus doesn't say, Thomas, you're on a roll now. Stop it. He acknowledges the statement. And he builds off of it. And that's so significant. Many people come to this text who deny the deity of Christ say, no, 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 no. That's not Thomas ascribing it. That's Thomas expressing his awe of the fact that Jesus rose again. Okay, so Thomas blasphemed. That's what, that's what people are saying. Thomas blasphemed, right? And Jesus doesn't reject it? Jesus doesn't rebuke it? It's worship. It's worship. And Jesus, again, receives it. Receives it. Now, it goes even further than that, because we can go to all these different moments in the Bible. These are just references for us to look at. But here's another layer. Not only is Jesus an object of worship, here's a question. Was Jesus the person of Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, was Jesus ever in the Bible prayed to directly? Let's, hold on, let's stop, rewind. Do we only pray to the Father? Or can we pray to any member of the Trinity? To the Father, in Jesus' name, by the Spirit, Or can I address the Father, the Son, or the Spirit? Ready? Jesus addressed God, but he was a man, so that's a good model for us. Okay, so Jesus presented a model to us by praying to the Father. I think it's normative to pray to the Father, but because every member of the Trinity is God, we can pray to each one individually, I think. Sure. Anybody would disagree with Paul? Nobody wants to disagree with Paul. (laughs) 
I don't know exactly where it was, but where Christ is, that he's a mediator between us and the Father. So he's a mediator between us and the Father, yeah. Okay. So elaborate. I, I still kind of agree with Paul. Okay, so you agree with Paul? To the Father, in the name of Jesus, by the Spirit, or can, do we have the freedom to address each of them in prayer? Can we sing to each member of the Trinity? By nature, as because each member of the Trinity is God, don't they demand worship individually because they're God? Mm. Absolutely. I would agree with that 100%. The argument is finished with that simple statement. That they are each God. And because they are each God, they each deserve worship and adoration. And they, we have the freedom to communicate to each member of the Trinity. Yet, what we do see is a pattern. There is an emphasis. There is a model that's heavier on the side of addressing the Father in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, we do have the freedom to do what? Let's look at these three scriptures. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. What do we see here? Stephen being stoned. You remember this? And who does he address? And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We can go to the next verse. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So he's addressing the Lord Jesus. He's speaking to the second member of the Trinity. Now Paul, when he's talking about the thorn in his flesh, remember? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We can turn there too if you want. We can come up on the screen in verse 7. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ, who's speaking, for my power is made perfect in my weakness. Christ is speaking directly to Paul. He's addressing the Lord, Jesus. And the final response in Revelations 22.20 we see the same thing, where John responds to the words of Jesus Christ himself. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Another response directly to the person of Christ. Directly to the person of Christ. So how do, I mean, everybody here is on the same page. I was surprised I was expecting more of dialogue on that question. But when we think about the fact that God is a Trinitarian God, we should address the Trinity, in our communication to him. I mean, we even see this in a benediction, right? In Paul's final benediction to the Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, he says, what? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So there he is, bestowing a blessing upon the, the Corinthians, and he's invoking each member of the Trinity that function in a specific way and for the people to experience each member of the Trinity. And so you and I have that freedom. You and I do have that freedom to, to, to communicate and to, to, to lean on in our, in our prayer language to specific members of the Trinity to, to, to do certain things or, or to thank them for something. You can thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. The Father didn't die on the cross. The Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the power for sin in my life to overcome it. That's okay. There, there's freedom in that. And yes, there is a pattern and we ought to follow that pattern, but there's also liberty to know that each member is God. Each member is, in fact, God. So we see that. So the point here, though, is that, okay, Jesus is, is not just worshipped. He's an object of prayer. What does that imply? That he's omniscient and omnipotent. He has all power. He has all knowledge. He can hear all of us praying at different times at different moments. That's God. Only God can do that. And so we're, we're the argument here that, Jesus is not God. The fact that he's worshipped and prayed to alone demands the fact that he is God. Let's close on this note. He wasn't just worshipped. He isn't just prayed to today. He will be adored by all men. 
He will be adored by all men. Isaiah 45, this is an awesome scripture. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. Isaiah 45, 21 to 23. This, would anybody like to read this scripture? Tamara, go for it. 21 to 23. How will bring forth your case? He has not come to counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from the time, from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. The just God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall take an oath. Sound familiar? Let's just, let's just address who's speaking here. The Lord. We see here that the Lord in verse 21, declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I? Jehovah. We're talking about God in the Old Testament here. And what is he doing? He's declaring his majesty, his holiness, his transcendence. He's declaring his power, his all-knowing power. And he's saying, I've told it from old. I can predict it from this point in history. No one is like me. And then he gives a prophetic word. There is a day coming, Jehovah speaking. There is a moment in history in which, to me, he says, to me, every knee will bow. And every tongue shall swear allegiance unto me. Sound familiar? This is Jehovah speaking. Then you have Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, taking that very same concept, that same phrase, and applying it to who? Jesus Christ in Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Does he not do that? Does he not do that? Does he not declare the humility of Christ, how he has come down in the flesh, how he became a servant, how he went to the point of death, and even death on a cross, and it says there in verse 8, and doing this, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, Isaiah 45, 21 to 23, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But wait, that's ascribed to Jehovah in Isaiah 45. Yes, but Jesus is Jehovah. And so this is what we understand. There is a worship service coming. It's going to be the grandest worship service. It's going to be a mixture of emotion. I can tell you that much. Because this moment in which it comes declares that every knee will bow, both of the wicked and the righteous. There is a time in which every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord before people go to hell for all eternity, and before people go into glory for all eternity. There is a moment, can you imagine the sight, where every knee will hit the ground and every tongue, whether they've praised God on earth or mocked God with their tongue, will in fact say, he is Lord. He is Lord. God will receive worship. Christ will receive worship from every single creature from Adam till this moment and even in the future. If the Lord chooses to tarry. And God will receive those acknowledgments before. Those who chose to say yes to him before he returned will enjoy him forever. I can't wait for that moment. Yes, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Very simple Bible study tonight but with the desire and the prayer for this response, that we would choose to worship Jesus, that we would choose to worship him in this moment in a special way to acknowledge him, to thank him even for these past few services in which we've explored his person and his nature, and to ask him to guide us continually through this Bible study. But what a way to end. If this is the final series message on this, what a way to end to say, Lord, we love you. We worship you. Here's the sacrifice of praise. Here's my sacrifice of praise. From my lips, I acknowledge your name with joy and with gratitude in my heart. Lord, receive worship in this place, in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. But let me give this final word. 
It's easy to worship what we're about to do right now. It's easy to repeat the songs. I go back to the first point. I know it's a Friday night. I know many people are here tired, squinty-eyed. But I have one question for people in here. Do you have an Isaac in your life? If Jesus were to scan through every single area of your life and say, do you love me more than these? Would you be able to say, yes, Lord, I love you? You know what? Jesus wasn't satisfied with Peter just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know what he was waiting for? That final command. He said, follow me. Because it's so easy to look at the fish. It's so easy to look at the blessing. It's so easy to look at your possession. It's so easy to look at this person and that person and say, yeah, Lord, I love you more than this. But it's a whole different thing when Jesus says, now turn away and walk with me. Turn away. Leave the fish in the net. Let them take care of themselves. And do what I ask you to do. Because I'll tell you this much. You and I singing lyrics off of a screen mean nothing. If you and I have not first decided in our hearts that we're willing to do whatever he calls us to do. And I want to challenge you tonight on this Friday night because you're in for joy. You're in for thrill. You're in for bliss. If you're willing to put it on the altar tonight. If you're willing to hold it back, you've just wasted another Bible study. But if you really want to know life and life abundantly, give it all up. Only God knows and only you know what that looks like in your heart. But ask the Lord to show it. Ask the Lord to reveal what it is and be willing to give it up. Be like Abraham and rise up early. Be like Abraham and make a choice. And here's the thing. Don't do it, don't do it just because somebody's yelling on the microphone telling you to do it. If you need three days, do three days. As long as you seriously contemplate your walk with God and evaluate your devotion to him, evaluate your love for him, evaluate between the moment you start walking with him and today, if there's been anything that's crept into your heart that is sitting on the throne of your affections over the person of Jesus Christ and be willing today to push that thing off and say, Jesus, this is your seat and your seat alone. And for those who have made that choice and daily make that choice, May it now be expressed in melody to the Lord. Father, we come before you in this moment. Lord, we pray that if this meeting has been anything but exciting, anything but heart-stirring, Lord, that it would change now. It would change in this moment, Lord. We would crucify our feelings and our emotions and look to you and give to you what you deserve, Lord. What men gave to you while you were walking on this earth, what people are choosing to do tonight and what every person will be forced to do at the weighty name of Jesus when it is declared before all creation how it will cause people's knees to buckle and to give it all to you one final time before they are cast into their eternal destination. Lord, we ask tonight that you would give us a glimpse of heaven. Give us a sample of what we're going to be doing for all eternity. And Lord, may you bless us with your presence because this is what we're here for. Lord, we look to you and we say thank you, Father, for your love. We look to you, Jesus, and say thank you for your grace. We look to you, Holy Spirit, and we say thank you for your power. And we ask, God, that we would know the fullness of the triune God and all the things that they offer each of us, Lord. We thank you, O oh God, that you are love. And Lord, we respond to that love by giving you our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.